talk to all these big, big kids. <clears throat> what I had in mind was to talk about candy. Anybody like candy? Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> so when, when you go around and, and you, you, you go in the parlor, say, about a month ago we had dishes of candy out there, like Easter time and things like that. We had, we had some candy out in the dishes. And I noticed that when people got to those dishes of candy, they were like, <laughs> pink ones, or someone else wanted the blue one, or the, you know, and sometimes all the ones that were probably peanut butter flavor got left over. But, but you know, everybody was really picky about, you know, and I noticed when we were collecting the candy each week to put it in the refrigerator so that it didn't melt or anything, it would get all sticky or full of ants during the week. I noticed that more and more of the same kinds of candy were left. <laughs> you know, it was like everybody loved the candy and they took some, but they only took the ones that they knew they were going to really like. <laughs> None of you do that, right? <laughs> it wasn't any of you. Well, I was actually going to look for candy, but I didn't have a bag of candy at home. I tried not to have bags of candy. Oh, we have some here. You have some here. Okay, well, anyway. Um, yeah, and I was going to show it to the kids. She knows where everything is. She's going to show it to the kids and say, okay, you know, pick a piece of candy. And then I was going to point out that they were picky about the candy that they picked. <laughs> so the whole point of that is that people aren't candy. People are all children of God. And... The lesson is, you know what, if you pick a different piece of candy, you might find out you like it. You know, with me, it would be fine unless it has peanuts in it, then that would be a problem. But, but you know, if, if other kinds of candy, you might find out you like it. And it's actually our job to share our love and to pick all the different kinds of candy. Anybody not been picked for a team? All the time. Oh, you're kidding. All the, I don't think it's <laughs> Oh, okay. Well... I usually get picked for the team, but you know, uh, you know, I saw, I've seen people that didn't get picked for the team, and how disappointing that is. You know, imagine how the little piece of candy feels. <laughs> anyway, let's put that in our brains and our minds. It must be kind of weird to think of people as candy, and we're not candy. But when we're making friends with people, or sharing good news, or whatever we've got, or love, it's really our job not to treat them like the candy, but to actually share with them, no matter who they are, where they are, with what they are, anything at all. Right? So that was my kids thing. So now you've got a free kids run. Okay. <laughs> all right. Yes. Gloria, turn on the Gloria. Let's stand together. It's time for us. Today is from 1 John 5, verses 1 through 6. 
everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born to God, and everyone who loves the parent loves the child. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For the love of God is this, that we obey his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome, for whatever is born of God conquers the world. And this is the victory that conquers the world, our faith. Who is it that conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with the water only, but with the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one that testifies, for the Spirit is the truth. The Gospel lesson today is from the Gospel of John, the 15th chapter, verses 9 through 17. Jesus is speaking. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you, so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer, because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends, because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands, so that you may love one another. May we hear what the Spirit is saying to us. Well, it's Mother's Day. And I'm going to talk about all of our readings, but first I want to talk a little bit about Mother's Day. So it's sort of a two-parter, a two-for today. Mother's Day is a wonderful day, a day of honor and joy and love and remembering precious things and precious times and people that are precious to us. And all of that is full of love and is good. There are those for whom Mother's Day isn't so good. And many years ago, when I was in my interim life in Louisiana, I sat near someone who told me that she wasn't going to go to church on Mother's Day because it was too hurtful for her. And um, I'm not a biological mother, I'm a stepmom. But this, but this woman had been married and it had lots of miscarriages and had been divorced and was beyond childbearing years. And for her, it was like salt and healed wounds to go to church that day. That made me really sad, but I did understand. So fast forward a few more years, and the pastor at the church where I was working at the time asked all of the mothers to stand. Now, I'm not going to ask all the mothers to stand today. Here's part of why. This other woman, not the same one from before, but another woman next to me, didn't stand and started crying. And I began to realize that for many women, they almost feel like they are empty. 
and devalued by that act. And it's not intentional on anyone's part. The intention is to honor mothers and what motherhood is about, which is a wonderful thing. But as a result, I talked with that woman and with the other woman I'd known before. I did a bunch of reading. I came across a list that I tweaked a little bit. And I'm going to read you the, the result of that. It's probably the result of at least a half dozen women about this. Because we can honor Mother's and Mother's Day without hurting those who could be hurt by it. So here, here's this list. And in this list, what I want to do is acknowledge the wide continuum of mothering. It's a long list, but it should only take me about a minute and a half to read it. So. To those who gave birth this year to their first child, we celebrate with you. To those who lost a child this year, we mourn with you. To those who are in the trenches with the little ones every day and wear the badge of food stains, we appreciate you. To those who have experienced loss through miscarriage, failed adoptions, or running away, we mourn with you. To those who walk the hard path of infertility, fraught with pokes, prods, tears, and disappointments, we walk with you. Forgive us when we say foolish things. We don't mean to make it harder than it is. For those who are foster moms, mentor moms, spiritual moms, and step moms, we need you. To those who have warm and close relationships with your children, we celebrate with you. To those who have disappointment, heartache, and distance with your children, we sit with you. To those who lost their mothers, we grieve with you. To those who experienced abuse at the hands of your own mother, we acknowledge your experience and we grieve with you. To those who have lived through driving tests, medical tests, and the overall testing of motherhood, we are better for having you in our midst. To those who have aborted children, we remember them and you on this day. To those who are single and long to be married and mothering your own children, we mourn that life has not turned out the way you longed for it to be. To those who step parent, we walk with you on these complex paths. To those who envisioned lavishing love on grandchildren and yet that dream is not to be, we pray for you. To those who have emptier nests in the upcoming year, we grieve and rejoice with you. To those who placed children up for adoption, we commend you for your selflessness and we remember how you hold that child in your heart. And to those who are pregnant with new life, both expected and surprising, we anticipate with you. This is Mother's Day. We walk with you. Mothering is not for the faint of heart, and we have real warriors in our midst. We remember you. How many of you know how Mother's Day got started? Probably a few of my parents Well, it's not a liturgical holiday. I know that's shocking, right? <laughs> not a liturgical holiday. I mean, even St. Patrick and St. Valentine's had feast days, but this isn't one of them. It's not a feast day for mothers. It's not part of the liturgical calendar, but it is important. So we do acknowledge it. It started with Julia Ward Howe. So a little bit of that story. You know who Julia Ward Howe is? While countries around the world do celebrate Mother's Days at different times of years, a lot of countries like us celebrate it on the second Sunday in May. And the official origins go back to 1870. Uh, she also wrote Battle of the Republic, by the way, and was an abolitionist. 
she worked to establish a Mother's Peace Day. And uh, she dedicated the celebration to the eradication of war. And she organized festivities in Boston for years and years. Then in 1907, Anna Jarvis in Philadelphia began a campaign to try to have Mother's Day officially recognized. And finally in 1914, President Woodrow Wilson did that. It's a national holiday, proclaiming it a national holiday and a public expression of our love and reverence for all mothers. Now, of course, we don't get one day off on Mother's Day or anything like that, but right now our sort of commercialized celebration of candy and flowers and gift certificates and crowded restaurants isn't quite in much resemblance to Julia Ward Howe's original idea. She wrote a proclamation. Now, please bear in mind, this is not my proclamation. But I would like to read you the proclamation so that you know what this was about for her. And remember, she was writing in 1870, just after the Civil War, when families and family members were fighting on opposite sides of the battles. And so so let's, let's put that in a little historical and social perspective. Here's what she wrote. We'll see if I can read this somewhat fancier language than I'm used to. Arise, all women who have hearts, whether your baptism be that of water or of tears, say firmly, we will not have great questions decided by irrelevant agencies. Our husbands shall not come to us reeking with carnage for caresses and applause. Our sons shall not be taken from us to unlearn all that we have been able to teach them of charity, mercy, and patience. We women of one country will be too tender of those of another country to allow our sons to be trained to injure theirs. From the bosom of the devastated earth, a voice goes up with our own. It says, disarm, disarm. The sword is not the bounds of justice. Blood does not wipe out dishonor, nor violence indicate possession. As men have often forsaken the plow and the anvil at the summons of war, let women now leave all that may be left of home for a great and earnest day of counsel. Let them meet first as women to bewail and commemorate the dead. Let them then solemnly take counsel with each other as to the means whereby the great human family can live in peace. Each learning after his own time the sacred impress, not of Caesar, but of God. In the name of womanhood and of humanity, I earnestly ask that a general congress of women, without limit of nationality, may be appointed and held at some place deemed to be most convenient and at the earliest period consistent with its objects to promote the alliance of all the different nationalities, the amicable settlement of international questions, the great and general interests of peace. So I don't think that we did have an international women's conference in 1870 to try to fix the world. But it is a, a powerful statement. And it comes from the heart of a woman and a mother who did not want to see her sons killing each other over land. It is not so much a condemnation of men and people going to war as it is a condemnation that humans go to war and fight each other about such things and do not love each other. So I actually love that Mother's Day, with her proclamation and with the story of the ladies of Shreveport that made me think long and hard about Mother's Day, uh, falls on this particular sixth Sunday of Easter in this particular lectionary year where our reading from the Gospel of John and the one from 1st John and even the one from the Acts deals a lot with the command to love each other, with the command to care for each other, and with the command to accept each other. Peter in Acts saying, you know, it doesn't matter that these people are Gentiles, they have been touched by the Holy Spirit and filled with that power, and they should be baptized to be part of our family. In 1 John, those who are following God's commandments are the family of God. It doesn't matter race, 
color, creed, size, anything. So this particular gospel passage and the accompanying lectionary passages contain a lot of familiar phrases that we recognize. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. This is what Jesus said to his followers as he was nearing his death. If you love me, keep my commandments. And as the Father has loved me, so I love you. John's whole gospel is all about love. Every single ingredient. His gospel tells us that we are known and cared for, like the sheep we talked about a couple of weeks ago. And now, we are loved so much that Jesus, who now calls us friend, not just follower, not just servant, but friend. Think of that like a partnership. He tells us he loves us so much he's laying down his life and that there is no greater life, no greater love than that. Now when we talk about giving up our life for someone, that might mean dying, but give some thought to what else that might mean. That might mean giving up some of our own little selfish things, for lack of a better technical term. Some of our selfish practices. It might mean giving up of our time to spend on others. The laws, the commandments, we're told in the epistle and in the gospel, the laws are not harsh or burdensome. Right? Into that. You see. In the epistle that Georgette read for us, for the love of God is this, that we obey his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome, for whatever is born of God conquers the world. They're not meant to be a big chore. They're not meant to be a big burden. Actually, they are an opportunity, a commandment to love. And to obey the commandment is simply to love. This isn't the command that's in the, I love you, but... <coughs> I wish you wouldn't cut your toenails in bed. No. I love you, but... No, that's not here. Rather, it's, I love you, and I want you to love one another. The end. But there's a so. I love you, so you must love one another. That's the love that we're given by God, by Jesus. That's the path to this true joy. It is an other-centered love. It is a belonging to something greater than yourself love. It is crucial to our lives, just as it was crucial to John's community, the community he was addressing at the time. Those people who were experiencing their world imploding as Jesus was facing death and they were running for cover to hide. Instead of turning inward, they are challenged to turn outward and to love each other and to share that love and transform the world with it. I often wonder whether Julia Ward Powell read these and thought about that in challenging the women to come together to find a way to make the world love. So the true test of whether we are following Jesus, whether we are being Jesus' friends, as he calls us, is whether we are following that command for love. It's a pretty clear and comprehensive framework for, framing, for forming our values in every situation. No matter how different our cultures, our technologies, no matter how sophisticated or not we are, we can ask ourselves about every single decision and every choice and plan and vision that we make, is this rooted in love? Does it bear fruit for the kingdom of God? That is the true test. 
This kind of love doesn't mean that romantic ephemeral feeling that fuels popular music, films, and sometimes even our personal quests. Being other-centered rather than self-centered, even to the point of giving up our lives, either suddenly or over a lifetime, fulfills the law of Christ. All those purity codes, those legalisms from the Old Testament, those fall away because the commandment is to love. And if we follow those commandments of loving God and loving one another as God loves us, everything else falls into place. It is that love of God that actually purifies us. How do we love the way that Jesus loves? I read a book, a little book by Henry Nolan, and in it he says, we are called to love Jesus the way Jesus loved. And in this book, there's sort of a, I guess I would call it a lens through which we can read this whole gospel passage. It says, knowing the heart of Jesus and loving him are the same thing. No one was writing about ministry in this book. And it's a book that many who study the ministry come across. But what he tells us is that we all can be ministers of the gospel, and Jesus has chosen us to love the world. We have a big mystery, and here's the words he says, Henry Young. The mystery of ministry is that we have been chosen to make our own limited and very conditional love the gateway for the unlimited and unconditional love of God. Kind of a lofty and challenging idea of that. I don't know how many of you have heard of Archbishop, Archbishop Oscar Romero. Some of you are nodding your heads. He is an example of this type of love. Uh, he knew how to be a prophet to the rich and a pastor to the poor and oppressed people of El Salvador. He was once a very comfortable and respected son of the institutional church, and he went way out to the margin of his life to champion the people that were suffering in El Salvador. He didn't turn away from them or ignore the setting in which he was preaching. Instead, he challenged the violent machinery of a corrupt state. Ultimately, he laid down his own life for these people that he loved. There was a film called Romero that um, I highly recommend. His life challenges us, and not either one of us is cut out to be an Oscar Romero. In every generation, from the generation alive when Jesus was alive, through John's generation when he was writing this, through our generation, we are given this word of assurance from Jesus in the next verses, past where we were today. He says, if the world hates you, be aware that it hated me before it hated you. We run into trouble being loving of everybody. Just remember that we can have the strength of Jesus to meet that. Jesus said, I appointed you to go and bear fruit. Last week we talked about being close to the vine, being close to Jesus and getting that energy and that power through the Spirit so that we can have the most juicy, strong, sweet fruit to share with everybody. How do we get close? By having a prayer life, by being open, by practicing love. Jesus knew it wasn't going to be easy for those disciples. He knew it wasn't going to be easy for the Oscar Romero's of the world or for each of us. We struggle every day, every moment, trying to live out our faith in everything that challenges it, trying to live a life of love when people hurt us. One of the keys is to ask ourselves, how does the world, how do others see us? Not how do we see ourselves. How do others see us? An awful lot of people think of the church as hateful, judgmental, and hypocritical. 
And those things are hard to read and hard to deal with, especially for those of us that are trying not to be that. So these verses today are sort of a call for a self-examination and reflection, just to make sure. Now, don't, don't be worried. I don't think of any single person in here as hateful, deceitful, hypocritical, or anything like that. But I encourage you to stay on top of it. Stay disciplined. Keep reflecting on every single thing. Is this rooted in love? Is what I'm doing at this moment hurrying to beat somebody else to the open gas pump? Is this rooted in love? Nobody can do that. Merging in traffic. You're gonna let me in! Rooted in love? I never heard about that. <laughs> we don't have to be the kind of hero Oscar Romero was called to be. Very few people are called to be him. It's hard enough just to live our lives slowly, day by day, with love for everybody, with love for the world. We live in a country that continues to debate its identity as a Christian nation, regardless of the separation of church and state, or the guarantee of freedom of religion to all, including non-Christians. Maybe we should ask why this is a problem. Why so many people that claim to be Christians cry out every time our nation moves towards a greater sharing with one another, including those who are not. Now understand, I would love to see everybody be Christians. But I don't believe that it's right for Christians to persecute those who believe differently. I'd like to read something to you that is a challenge to Christians. It's a haunting story, and it comes from Jim Wallace in his book called The Call to Conversion. In the book, he describes something that happened at a conference in New York City on social justice, and that conference included religious leaders of all kinds. Here's the excerpt. At one point, a Native American stood up, looked out over the mostly white audience, and said, regardless of what the New Testament says, most Christians are individualists with no real experience of community. He paused for a moment and then continued. Let's pretend that you were all Christians. If you were Christians, you would no longer accumulate. You would share everything you have. You would actually love one another, and you would treat each other as if you were family. His eyes were piercing as he asked, why don't you do that? Why don't you live that way? Let's pretend we are all Christians. What would that look like? And how might it be different from the way we live today? All of that was from Jim's book. An interesting challenge when we read about the Acts of the Apostles and how the early Christian community lived. And we even see much of that kind of living in our own small community here. With the giving of food. With the welcoming of absolutely everybody and with the sharing of our love and our resources. So let's keep doing that. And let's ask, every time we do something or take an action, is it rooted in love? Are we caring for each other? Is Bethel a safe space where each person is known and cared about, or can be known and cared about? Have any of you, and I hope you can, well, I'll ask the question. Have you ever experienced another person or a community being for you? Has another, has a group of people actually actively worked and given that love and that support that is for you. I see that happen in the Real Love for Life community. 
I see it happen here. I even see it happen at Cal State Dominguez Hills. I have a student, a severely handicapped student, trying to take conducting. She cannot stand. She cannot sit in a chair without sliding down out of the chair and constantly having to push herself back up. She has really no strength in, in her lower spine. She can sort of stand up for a minute and move over to a different chair. Her right hand cannot move this way at all. It can only do this. She has to use an iPad most of the time to type and take notes. She's a music education major and she has to take conducting. You've all seen me conduct. It's a very physical activity. So she conducts with her left hand. She sits in a chair and she tries to stay up on the chair. And partway through the piece, she'll be sliding down, she'll have to push herself back up. Here's what happened for her final last week. We had to spread our conducting final out over three class sessions because they had to conduct a whole piece for each other. One of the students sat behind her on the chair and held her in the chair so that she was free to move her arm to stay on the right beat and the right page. So she made it through her final. She did not get an A. An orchestra would never be able to really follow her. But maybe, maybe some school kids that she takes months to work with and teach them every little bit of it so they know what she's about and what she's doing, she is going to touch lives. She's an amazing person. She won't get an A in the She might get a B minus. She's got a C on her final. But her academic work, her writing stuff, her reviews, her, her analysis of the music, it's all A work. And she is determined. She's in the string class too, trying to play the cello. Of course, she won't really, really play the cello, but her dad has come up with various devices to help her get it secure so that she can at least try. And she can understand how it's supposed to be played. So do you have someone like that, like my student that held her up? You probably do. You probably have at least one person in your life. And I challenge all of us to be those people for all of those other people. Amen.